Welcome to episode 82 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Liberty Dad, Dad Talk, and I've invited Dr. Philip Fletcher to have a chat. What's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot or even none at all. This series is all about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear some dads discuss some ideas that you disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Philip talks about his work helping those in poverty, how it plays a role with him as a dad and a libertarian. And we even mention Legos. Let's dive in and hear what he has to say. All right, Philip Fletcher. I'm going to call you Philip from now on. This is Dr. Fletcher for everybody that's watching. Philip, go ahead and just let's get into this and tell me who you are. Uh, you know, you, you Tell us who is Dr. Philip Fletcher. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot, DL. So uh, husband of Nicole, be married uh, 24 years. It's coming Monday. As a matter of fact, uh, we have three children, uh, Nicholas, who is age 23. Uh, he works and lives out in Salt Lake City, Utah. We have a daughter, Najee. She lives here in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, she's 21. And then we have a daughter who is 19. Michelle, and she lives in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She goes to school at the University of Arkansas. Uh, so, so husband, uh, father, uh, live in uh, Conway, Arkansas, which is about 30 minutes uh, west, excuse me, east of Little Rock. Okay. Um, and about two hours from Memphis and moved here 14 years ago. I was in the United States military. I was a, uh, a combat arms officer uh left out as a captain and we moved here uh, so i could finish some seminary and i was okay. going to go back on active duty to be a chaplain uh but different plans and we started a nonprofit back in 2007 called the city of hope outreach uh and our goal our mission is to provoke hope in individuals uh who experience poverty and homelessness and so we focus on education housing and community development. So we've been doing that for 14 years, have a local and a statewide influence. Um, outside of that, uh, love to delve into politics and mm -hmm. social issues. So I got a podcast called the Community Matters Podcast on, a, you can find that anywhere you get podcasts. And I got a YouTube channel and like to delve into uh, politics, social issues and come at it from a uh, leadership perspective. Okay. Uh, great, greatly influenced by a philosophy called personalism. Uh, it's what I did my dissertation on. Um, and personalism is simply the idea, uh, idealistic personalism specifically, specifically the idea uh, that human beings, all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. We reflect a supreme personal God. And as a result of that inherent dignity and worth, that should uh, influence our approach to one another, but also how we uh, view ourselves and moving forward in society. So a lot of that influences my work in my nonprofit, but also uh, talking about politics and social issues, things like that. Um, do public speaking nonprofit leadership consulting because my PhD is in organizational leadership. Okay. Just like to enjoy superhero stuff. So behind me, right. Uh, my backdrop is Marvel right now. Nice. It's from Marvel to DC to star Wars. Okay. Like my three big things. Um, I like to collect action figures and Funko pops and Legos. I got uh 68 star Wars Legos. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, here in my office and in my garage. So I'm working on a, a Lego right now. It's a Jeep. Huh. Like it. Yeah, so I got a Jeep, uh, a car I drive, and uh, Lego came out with this uh, car series, uh, Fast and the Furious Jeeps and things like that. So that's the project I'm working on over the holidays. So, okay. yeah, that's who I am. I like to do CrossFit. I uh, like to read a lot. Okay. Um, I like to 
be by myself a lot of times uh just to to breathe and relax um but yeah that's me that's me sounds like you're into sounds like you're into a lot of things yeah i I like it yeah i do i try to um you know like i spend my week you know working with people who experience a lot of difficult things Mm -hmm. you know whether it's on an economic situation a relational situation they're lacking housing and you know i need you know something for myself right you know and be able to you know heal and reflect and like especially like comic books and collectibles um i'll go to this local comic book store and it's full of like those 20 year 19 20 year olds who are playing (laughs) like pokemon and right all of these type of card games and i vibe with them you know and i i do this whole shift right I'm hanging out with them. We're talking about comic books and, you know, the new cosplay costumes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And people look at me and they'd be like, they would never peg me for that. Right. And I'm like, but it's, it's my outlet. And uh, it's, it's very helpful for me. And uh, my kids have picked up on it Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, little bits and pieces of it. They think I go a little too far. I'm a little nerd, but that's okay. Right. Um, But uh, my daughter always said she's thankful that I introduced her to the to the superhero life because that got her involved in orchestra Mm. uh, and wanted to play John Williams and Hans Zimmer and and all that stuff. So, right. uh, Nice. So being a nerd can, you know, has its benefits. So, yeah, Yeah. I I, I agree. Um, I don't know that I ever got into comic books and Mm. um, and stuff like that is you know is um trying to i'm trying to i'm trying to navigate my my podcast here because i'm doing something new so don't mind me if i seem a little bit distracted every now and then um just trying to get the uh the the focus um at any rate uh so you know i i i don't think i really got into things along that line as much and it used to be that my hobby was like programming and writing code and stuff like that And okay. then I switched to uh, doing that for a living. Okay. And one of the things that I would always always afraid of is that I would switch, and my hobby would no longer be as fun. And mm. to some degree, that I, I don't want to say that's exactly happened, but mm-hmm. because I spend so much time on the computer, yeah. I think my hobby has kind of said I I want to go do something else. So I like cycling and. Okay. I'm really big in cycling. I like to go to events and and they're not really competitive events. I mean, they have like first, second, third place sometimes, but they're not really designed to be like, that's that's not the primary purpose. They're, they're more like, um, uh, events where there are charity rides and stuff like that. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. But I've been really getting into working with tools in the garage Okay. and it helps out with my son now because he loves tools. Yeah. Like uh, I, I, he's he's not even three yet. And I made him his own workbench okay. and I gave him an old uh, drill that I had. It's a plug in drill because I got nice. upgrades. Nice. And I let him use it. And I started out by just giving him a bunch of screws and he, he like will screw in and out of just the wood on his workbench. Yeah. And but the, but but I, uh, I I felt that was a bit of a problem because we do that in the garage. And some, you know, I was always afraid that I might miss a screw and then we run over it with the with the car. Yeah. So I swapped all those out and I went and got a, spe- a specific type of bolt. Um, it's called a T-bolt, but and we don't have to really go into the details. But effectively, what I do is now I have holes drilled in the wood with kind of like you might think of it as embedded um, nuts so that yeah. he can put bolts in there. Okay. And then I gave him some attachments so that he can screw and unscrew the bolts, or he can use a, a wrench or a ratchet. And so now we've kind of switched over so that if I if I happen to miss one, first they're bigger, so they're easier to see. So yeah. no, I understand. Like it's it, it's fun and it's enjoying to go outside. I just recently got a, a new router table for my router that I got for a fence that okay. I built. Okay. And so now I'm like eyeballing. Up. Like I was literally at the store today looking at. Um, at router bits. And I was, I was thinking like I was going to buy one. Then I was like, nah, I was like, you know, these are kind of expensive. Maybe I should just go ahead and buy a whole set, which means I'm going to now wait so yeah. that I can buy a decent set and, you know, kind of 
go and price shop and whatnot. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of my awesome. thing. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I get to share like it with my son. You when I'm in the comic book store. Right. <laughs> and and I get to share it with my son. So like yeah. that's yeah. That, that's so exciting. Right. That is. And um and I, and I think that's one of the great things about being a dad is that you get to share some of these things. Yeah. Um, and eventually, you know, I, I'll share other things. Uh, maybe I mean, depends on how he, you know, how he, uh, how his personality turns out. So right now he goes to Libertarian Party events. Okay. But maybe in the future, maybe when he's like fourteen, he's gonna be like, Nah, Dad, that that's not me anymore. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm something different. You know, you know, DL. You know, speaking about that, um, I remember when I was in the military. Uh, so on base, you could you know take your cars and you could do your own. They had these your maintenance. They have maintenance bays for. Uh, your vehicles mm-hmm. so you could go there do your oil changes change tires and things like that and so um you know at that time we were stationed at fort knox so my son he'd been about three four years old mm-hmm. um i would take him with me um and show him like you know this is the underside of the truck okay, okay? this is how you you know drain the oil out okay and right. You know, replace the bolt. You know, we lower back down. We gotta take off the filter, and mm-hmm. you know all those good things. And you know, having those moments uh, with him, and you know, then when as he got older, and then he got his own car. You know, hey, these are the other things that you need to check. You know, mm-hmm. now he's able to really comprehend. You know what's going on, and you know, right. you need to take care of your car, right? This is gonna get you from school and back and football right. practice back. Uh, and so having those moments as a father, specifically with uh, your son, those are so huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are very formative uh, for your son specifically. Right. Uh, you know, and as they are growing up. And now I, um, when he moved out, he moved out to Salt Lake City, Utah, mm-hmm. to, uh, two weeks now. And me and him drove out there. Uh, to move his stuff out there and all that. So we spent 20 hours on the road, you know, just talking, um, you know, listening to the radio, sometimes just sitting in silence, you know, Mm -hmm. that's how we can be sometimes. Right. You know, just talking about now, like man to man stuff. Right. You know, there's a, there's a transition that happens. There's encouragement to you. Um, Right. You know, as a, as a dad, you know, as a father, you know, as your, your son gets older and, and other kids you and your wife may have, um, you know, it's that parent child relationship. And then it begins to change, you know, as they become teenagers and mm-hmm. then when they become adults. Now you're looking at your three year old who was in the garage with you. Like, right. This is a full blown man. Yep. You know, and um, I need to approach him as such and have those um good discussions with him and mm-hmm. uh, help him to find an aim. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think when we give our children an aim, um, that helps them to, you know, find purpose right, and meaning in life. Um, and, you know, when I dropped him off, uh, he took me to the airport to fly back to Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was just a, a sweet moment, you know, mm-hmm. cause and I told him and I put my hand on his chest and I said, you know, you're a man. You're like, right. you're, you're hours away from home now. Mm-hmm. And uh, everything that we put in you uh, just, you know, unleash it. Uh, right. You know what it is that you want to do in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got your goals now, you know, make it happen. You know, we believe in you. Mm-hmm. You know, you're reminding them that, hey, we're always here. Right. Right. Uh, um, you know, now achieve your goals. And, 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 and this is what I say to fathers, you know, kiss your sons, mm-hmm. kiss them on the forehead, right. You know, let them know that healthy affection that is okay. Right. Uh, tell them that you're proud of them mm-hmm. uh, in a positive manner. So, um, yeah, I talk about that all day. Uh, Did you, um, Here's an interesting question, I think. Did yeah. you give him any kind, it sounds like you did, but did you give him any kind of what you might call, this is the moment where I'm affirming that you are now a man? Yes. Like, Because I feel like that's really, really missing in society. Yes. So um, when he turned uh, 16, 
I got a cabin uh, for him and I. It's called Petty Jean Mountain. Mm-hmm. And we went the weekend up there. So it's about an hour from here. I mean, it's away from everything, you know, camping and all that kind of stuff. And we just spent that whole weekend uh, spending time with one another, me pouring into him, mm-hmm. uh, going hiking. We played Risk. We cooked. Mm-hmm. All nice. of those good things and, you know, set that up to be like, you, you've made this transition, if you will. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, there's going to be other transitions that happen, but I want to take this time to specifically acknowledge this transition. And then right. the other thing, um, I, I, he got a tattoo. Uh, so our name, uh, my last name means arrow maker. Okay. Fletcher. Right. Uh, my dad had did the homework of some years ago, looking at our family history and what the name Fletcher means, f- Fletchings. And okay. Uh, so I put that together to be Arrow Maker. Um, gotcha. And so at 16, I took him to the uh, tattoo artist and um, I want this on his forearm. He's got the exact same one on his hmm. forearm. Um, and then when our girls turned 16, they got similar ones. And so all, every member of our family has got one when they hit a, a point in their life. Mm, interesting. Um, and so uh, that actually gave them something to look forward to. But that right. was another moment, yeah. too, when he was like, OK, we're ready to get this tattoo now. And I got it. He's 16. There's other things going on about getting a tattoo. But right. Right. Yeah. Um, but to be able to say, hey, uh, arrow maker family, and you got five arrows and he's got the five arrows on his forearm. Um, that was that other, if you will, circumcision or baptism mm-hmm. or you right. know, other cultures have bar mitzvahs so right. and so forth that we established for our family. Okay. Um, and, and the hope is, you know, they would carry that on into, you know, their family as right. well. Um, but yeah, I would encourage, you know, fathers specifically create a tradition create something Mm -hmm. that like you like you've asked that marks that transition from one stage of life to the next right you know that's you know got it we got like graduations and things like that but this is something specific to right family that i think can go a long way um, yes in life yeah mine wasn't quite as elaborate Uh uh-huh um But I do remember my dad one time, I I used to have this habit when I was a younger kid of going to my mom and my dad and just asking all sorts of questions like, what do you think I should do here? What do you think I should do there? Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly one day, I I don't know how much past 18 I was, but I went to my dad and I, I asked a question and he said, son, you are a man now. It is time to act like it, make a decision and learn to live with it. Something Mm. like that. I I don't know if those were the quite the exact words, but it was pretty close. Yeah. And um, it had a tremendous impact because, you know, he basically was telling me, like, son, you have made it. You are now here. And I feel like we don't have that. And I don't don't, don't think it has to be the same for everybody. I think it can be different. Kind of like you said, hey, we've got this tattoo tradition. Uh, Mine was, you know, much more simple, just a simple one moment yeah, uh, that I just happened to remember that really, really stood out, and it's it, it's affected me in tremendous way. It might even be how it got me to libertarianism in a way, right? Like, okay, because uh, the idea of libertarianism is that we we believe in personal responsibility, right? And my dad was imparting this idea upon me. I mean, it was just so simple, right? But he was still imparting this huge idea, like. Son, you have to make a decision and you have to learn to live with that decision, right? Yeah. Like you have to be personally responsible for the decisions that you make, good or bad. That's the one that you made. Right. So, um, you know, and, and I guess I got a few years. I mean, my son's only, I mean, he'll be three coming up in February. So I yeah. got a few years to worry about, you know, what, you know, are we going to have a tradition or, or am I yeah. just going to take him out right. and, you know, walk through the woods or go out on a, you know, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever the case may be. But there, I think that every I think that every dad should have something that they do, I because I think I believe that dads are critical to um, to the family. 
and um, it's a hill I'll die on for sure. I, I, I'll be right on that hill with you. Uh, you know, part of our uh, our work at our nonprofit, you know, we work with a lot of uh, young boys and mm -hmm. girls, and I gravitate obviously to the males, and a lot of males, um, they have fathers that, they have fathers, mm -hmm. they're just not present. Right. Um, and the conversations that I've had with young men over the years, uh, DL, it is it is something to see what would be like a big strapping 16 year old mm -hmm. or some of these 16 year olds who portray themselves as being like hard and street wise right. on Snapchat and, you know, their right. social media and things like that. Right. As soon as I've gotten a room with them and we talk about talk to me about your dad. Mm -hmm. Right. And there is this mix of sadness and mm -hmm. anger. Right. That is going on. Right. Um, where I've had young men um, like fall in my arms and just cry, man, because, mm. you know, their, their father is not there, not trying to be involved. And you see the effects of that. Right. Like it, you just see it. Sadly, the moms or auntie or grandma is bearing the brunt of this one missing individual who's, right. who's if his voice was consistent, was present and consistent, mm -hmm. would could change the whole direction, this whole thing. Right. Um, and I've had one young man say to me, he was like, well, what if I don't love my dad? He ain't never there. You've never done nothing for me. Right. Why I gotta love him. Why I gotta respect him. Right. You know, and and you gotta sympathize with that. Right. You, you know, I don't have that experience. Yep. My dad, he's uh 73 years old. I've never not known him not to be there. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. So to to hear that young man's pain and all that kind of stuff was huge. Like yeah. I was there for his high school graduation. His dad wasn't. And, and, you know, those are those those things that just uh, break my heart. And the number, the, the thousands of, I don't think I'm overstating, the thousands of young men who don't have their fathers in their life for whatever reason mm -hmm. is, is disconcerting. And it sends them, it sends those young boys to go find something to aim for. Right. They're, they're, they're looking for something. Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to come in who may not have their best interest at heart and like, okay, I'll aim you somewhere, you know, and, right. um, and more often than not, they're being aimed for that a particular direction so that they're being used, mm -hmm. you know, and something's being taken from them. And right. it's sad. Um, fathers are, you know, by design are, are, are givers supposed right. to pour in you know and right. uh, you know what you talk about here even on your podcast and in your show even in your title liberty dad that says a lot like right. that, it does appreciate it it really does it does yeah i have a a kid that oh, he's not a kid anymore he's an adult now he's a man and mm -hmm. i used to mentor him through this okay. program here in jacksonville we have a an organization called daniel kids now i've always had a leaning toward disadvantaged kids mm -hmm. i don't really know why i'm not sure what the you know i wasn't a disadvantaged kid myself yeah me so yeah i, I don't yeah. know what it is but i used to be a youth director back in my day when, when you know when i was in my 20s and i worked with kids that would basically be considered that you know from the wrong side of the tracks mm -hmm. and then you know when i came to jacksonville scroll forward like 20 years i decided to get involved in this organization called daniel kids and i went and i became a mentor and they told me, they said, we have, you know, plenty of mothers because what they do is they, I'm sorry, not mothers, but women. They said what they yeah. do is they, they will um, bring in kids that have social workers and then they will put, they will match the, the women mentors with the girls and then the man, the men mentors with the young boys. Okay. And so I was matched with a young man and it was a rough time because he hadn't had a dad. I don't think really ever. He didn't ha have a, a male role model. And so I got to him when I, he was like 15 and a half, almost 16 years old. So a lot of his behaviors 
have yeah. already been settled in and it's you know and then it's somebody else's kid so there's you know and then you're only working with them you know a few hours yeah. a week yeah. so there's like i mean the odds are stacked against me yeah but um he uh he grew up in jacksonville and then he decided that he met a he, he met a girl on facebook i i guess that's a thing like <laughs> I, yeah. I understand online dating. I was not expecting someone to say, yeah, I met a girl on Facebook. I'm going to go Facebook, live with her in Nevada. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. Okay. And I know family members were like, oh, they were discouraging him. Like, oh, you'll be back. And I was like, go, go fly, go, go have an experience. Mm -hmm. Because the way I looked at it, I was like, you need to see, not, not, not so much see the world like, okay, you're going to see some culture over in Nevada necessarily. But yeah. when you get out of your environment, you see other environments, you see other people and I think that's what helps people start to realize that there are other attitudes and behaviors that they've never known that mm -hmm. they might want to adopt. Yeah. And he came back to visit a, a month ago, and we went out to dinner with him and his, uh, I'm not sure if it's fiance yet, but girlfriend at least. Okay. And it was so funny because I remember a long time ago we went to the store, and he he was he was short a dollar one dollar and he's like man can i get a dollar and i was like no because i wanted him to I, I i i and and the reason i did it was not because i was just trying to be a jerk yeah yeah, yeah. i was like look man you need to work within your means yeah this is not something that you've had to learn this is something you're going to have to learn like you don't have a dollar you don't just get necessarily you might have to do without you might have to pick something that's you know yeah. less expensive less quality yeah. whatever you know and so he was kind of upset at me. But here was the fun part. We go to dinner, and then after dinner, he's like, now I'm an adult. I pay for you. And I was just like, man. I was like, like wow. that just kind of hit me because I was like yeah. – because I always wonder, like, did I actually have an impact? Mm -hmm. And all I could rely on was like, well, he didn't get any worse. Like, he's, he didn't end up in jail, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's got a good job, and he's – um, he 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 had some plans that they were working on that to maybe yeah. expand and get their own business of some sort, you know. So he, so he's you know he's moving along in a way that yeah. I think is is meaningful, yeah. and so that that meant a lot to me to see that. But then just you know I pay for you now, like yeah. it was just it was neat and yeah. you know and and I and I do my best, you know. The moment he turned eighteen, treat him like he's eighteen. Like all right. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. talk to you like you're a mentee anymore. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I don't give you a hard time. I don't, you know, I just, you know, I just, I, I treat you like you would be an adult that yes. I know now. And if I got something to say, I say it like you're an adult. Yes. Yes. That's, that's good, man. I, I like the, the, the necessity. We have to, uh, we have to provide opportunities for, mm -hmm um our children as well and even in a mentor mentee type role right for them to experience not only success but also how will they confront failure right you know and so in that instance he didn't have a dollar right you know so even in that moment you provided him the opportunity well how am i going to confront this right because that's something that's going to continually come in mm -hmm our lives you know so you talk about uh personal responsibility we talk about the intersection of that with libertarianism we talk mm -hmm. about the intersection with that with of being a, a father and how am i going to have my kid learn personal responsibility right they're gonna have to learn how to negotiate this information that's in front of them mm -hmm. and 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 make decisions but also be able to live with those decisions right you know and their trade-offs that's one of the things yep I talked to uh, kind of invoking a Thomas Sowell. He mm -hmm. talked about trade-offs a lot. There are negative yep. and positive trade-offs. Yep. Right? I see him in the background. Yeah. I'm yeah. jealous. Yeah. I yes. want a poster like that. <laughs> uh, um, give me your address. All right. Yes. It's, yeah. it's one of my favorite quotes actually from him where mm -hmm. he says, uh, uh, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. Trade and, exactly. and that is something that is just that one line has stuck with me for a long time yes. from yes. Uh, from Dr. Soul. And I was just like, wow. And, and when I started applying that, just things around me, like it doesn't matter what it was, you know, you right. you want to go and spend 
twenty dollars on something. You want to go uh, spend twenty minutes on Twitter, whatever. You know, like it just applies everywhere. It's yes. just amazing. Yeah. So you know, even with our kids, um, uh, I tell we've told, always told our kids, you know, there's pr- high price tags and low price tags. You, you know, and you got to be able to figure those things out. Make a decision, right? You make it even if you make a mistake, mm-hmm. you've made a decision. Yep. But learn from that decision that you made, right? So that if a similar situation comes around again, you know better how to respond to it, and mm-hmm. that's just wisdom, right? Um, and and I think that's the other thing we want our kids to get to, so that when they leave the house. Mm-hmm. They are better equipped. They have that mindset. Your mentee had that mindset. I'm an adult now. Right. That was just a change in mindset. And right. I want to pay for you, you know, yep. and uh, that does go a long way. It and, does. Uh, it does show that you, those discussions and, you know, time spent, uh, that seed is blossoming now. Right. Uh, and and, yep. and I think I think the interesting thing that, um, that we don't give credit enough to men is that it, you know, it's okay to make a mistake and, and maybe yeah. get it wrong from, from time to time. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't want to get like wildly wrong. I mean, you know, you can't haul off and, you know, punch your right. toddler, right. Uh, you know, I mean, so, but I like to think that kids, uh, when they're growing up, I think that they can tell when an adult cares about them. And mm-hmm. I think that they are very resilient to mistakes when you're honestly trying to get it right. And maybe you do some things that aren't quite so right. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you an example. On Easter Sunday, because we, we, the kid that I was uh, a mentor or to, we would meet up on Sundays. So on Easter Sunday, I go to his house, and he had been, uh, he was supposed to be studying his G, for his GED. Okay. And we went out, we bought a book, and it was one of those books where you kind of go through it, and you, uh, it has like different questions and then they have the answers in the back and then it just basically prepares you to take the GED. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to go through this. And I gave him a a small portion of it. And it it, it was like two weeks prior or something. So I show up and I'm like, all right, hey, what's going on? Where where are we with this, you you know, with with the book? And he he didn't have anything completed. I mean, he didn't even open the book. And so I was, I was kind of, I was kind of annoyed with him uh, because I was like, man, we're, we're running out of time to do something here with your high school graduation and mm-hmm. GED situation. Like we're running out of time. Like at, at a certain point, it's a done deal. I mean, kind of, I mean, you can still, I mean, he could be 30 and still get his GED, yeah. but yeah. Th- th- there are a lot of problems that we, I don't think we really need to go into with that. And so I was giving him a hard time and I didn't like his answers because he kept making excuses. He was like, Oh, well, it's just too easy. And I was like, well, if it was so easy. Why didn't you just do it? <laughs> and then it would be done. And then we would know where you are and we would know what maybe we can skip. How many right? times has that been said? <laughs> right. I gave him such a hard time. And I was, I mean, I wasn't rude. I didn't cuss at him. I didn't do anything. Yeah. But I gave him such a hard time and took him through the ringer that, because that, this was about a 20 minute ordeal. He okay. finally got mad and he was like, DL, we're done for today. I just want to spend time with my family. <laughs> he made me leave like 20 minutes after I got there. And I was driving home and I was like, oh my God, did I screw this one up? Like, mm-hmm. is he going to call and be like, I don't want DL as a mentor anymore? Yeah. And um, no, he didn't. We continued mentoring. Um, and one of the other joys that I had when he moved to Nevada, he was going to a uh, Black Lives Matter protest. Okay. And one of the people that I, this, I had, he had mentioned it on Facebook. And one of my friends had just recently posted like this list of things, like a checklist, if you're going okay. to a protest. And it was like, okay. here are some things that you might do if you're going to a protest and you think things might get a little out of control, kind of like to protect okay. yourself, right? So it was like, yeah. you know, have a, have a lawyer or a bailsman, uh, bail, bail bond on hand, you know, the number on hand, um, charge your phone. Um, if you think you're going to get maced, have, I don't know, milk or something. I just a long yeah. checklist of, of different things. So I copied that and I pasted it on his, on his com as a comment. And mm-hmm. I said something like, be vocal and be safe. 
something like uh-huh. that. Or stay yeah. vocal, stay safe. That's what I said. Stay vocal, yeah. stay safe. And he um, he said thanks, and then he came back like a few days later, and he was just like, he's like, DL, I just want, I just want to say that you're the best mentor I ever had. He goes because some of um, some of the other mentors that I had would have just said that I was being racist or something like that. Uh-huh. And you know, I, like I I I try to, even though I'm a libertarian, I try to approach it like I want to support him and kind of more subtly impart any of those kind of ideas like personal responsibility. Well, some of them yeah. I would want to impart very outwardly, but some of them right. in, anything anything that overlap with politics, I want to be very careful not to inject my politics, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but more importantly, just support him in what he was doing. Like, okay. If you're going to go here, you should probably be safe. Call yeah. it a day, you know, and actually I, I wouldn't, I, I didn't have a, I don't have a problem with him protesting anyway, mm-hmm. but even if I did, even if I said, I don't think that, you know, if he went to a protest that I didn't, I disagreed with, I would still have done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so it was just, there was a lot, I mean, I, I, I could go over, you know, tons and tons of different moments and I'm sure I'm going to have some with my son. But yeah. let's continue talking about you. Yeah. So you 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 do you uh, have this poverty in um, education and housing. So tell me more about that. Yeah. So like I grew up middle class. Mm-hmm. Um, parents been married fifty years. This coming February. Right. Wow. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, both of them college educated. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Poverty for me is, you know, something read about, you know, mm-hmm. you see on commercials and things like that. And it wasn't until, I mean, I saw real poverty when I was in the military overseas. Mm-hmm. Right. Conditions people had to live in. Um, but when we moved to Arkansas, um, through a series of events, ended up uh, starting our nonprofit ministry in this trailer park. Mm-hmm. And um, predominantly... Uh, the individuals we were working with, they weren't black, who mm-hmm. would be considered the face of poverty. You know, it's mm-hmm. um, uh, just regular, over, everyday, poor white people right. um, in trailer parks. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had some black people living there, you had Latinos right. living there, uh, individuals, but even in that situation, they had different circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, and I began to understand uh, that, you know, poverty is the inability to make a meaningful choice to affect one situation. All right. Um, And so that's the the definition I've operated off of. um, How can we create greater opportunity for individuals uh, to make a meaningful choice to affect their life? Mm -hmm. I don't want to come in and tell you what to do. Uh, because how I want to live my life and mm-hmm. the goals that I have, the vision I have for my life and my family is different than yours. But then we also have some c- things that are in common, regardless uh, if you're poor or middle class or, or rich, mm-hmm. is if you got a family, uh, you typically want to see your house do well, right. your kids do well. Um, you live in a place that's not falling in um you have food um you know be able to you know do some of the general entertainment type things okay across the board everybody would find agreement with that okay um it's just as the greater opportunities that you have and the more resources you have the more choices that you you can make right to i want this size house or this color Mm -hmm. house you know but if i've only got X amount of dollars a month, mm-hmm. um, and it's limited because I'm hourly, and it only in the place that I can afford to live in is in this particular part of the city. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my opportunity to make a meaningful choice is significantly lessened than somebody else in comparison. Okay. So um, with us and the City of Hope Outreach. We just want to create an opportunity for people. We want to have individuals, um, you know, they come into our office. What is your goals? Mm -hmm. What is it that you want to achieve? Okay. What are you lacking? Right. Okay. Here are the resources that we have available that we can work together with you 
we don't talk, we don't use language for you, but how can right. we do things with you? How can we do things together so that you can be one step closer to what life would look like for you? Okay. Okay. Um, and so that that's hard work. It's long work because you're dealing with human beings, right? And you know, dealing with human beings, uh, you know, just like we talked about, even as uh, fathers, you know, when you're dealing with an adult who has lived a particular way and who has particular access to uh, limited resources, they've made particular decisions. So right. you're going to have to take that time from my vantage point, you know, from our staff's vantage point, you got to understand that person across the table from you. Right. You know, you got to understand their view of the world. Right. Why they speak the way they do, why mm -hmm. they make the particular decisions that you make. And once you understand that, um and educate yourself mm -hmm. uh, then the two of you can sit down and figure out okay what is it that we can do together right um, let's take some steps and then let's review this right um, a lot of that i take from um martin luther king's uh non-violent approach okay uh, you know you gather information you know you educate yourself you sit down with the individual um y'all come to some type of reconciliation, mm -hmm. you know, you do the direct action or excuse me, do the direct action, then you use some reconciliation. So it's kind of a similar vantage point. Okay. I need to know the individual across from me so that I know what resources he or she needs. Right. If he or she doesn't need that resource, then I don't need to bring it to the table. Right. Uh, and at the same time, um, I want to be able to affirm their dignity, mm -hmm. who they are as a human being. Right. I want to respect <clears throat> their agency. I want them to, um, to celebrate what it is that they are doing, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, staff, coho to fade into the background. Uh, we were just like, like, here's, we're just a step. You step up on us to get to the next thing. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of my work has taken me, that led me into a lot of politics stuff mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, especially on the local level, um, you know, things like zoning and mm -hmm. code enforcement and things like that. Those are things that are instituted at a municipal level, mm -hmm. city council type level. And you got to go meet with those city council people you know, commissions and things like that. And ask them like, okay, why is this? Right. Why is this allowed to persist? Or why are individuals uh, having to pay these things? Is there a better way that we can do this? Because it's disproportionately impacting one group of uh, a particular group of people in this particular economic situation. So um, there's that other part of working in poverty work, if you will, is, yeah, you can understand, there's a charitable side. Also, there's the policy side. Mm -hmm. And then there is the policies that uh, become ordinances or laws that you need to understand. Um, then you also got to understand the business side right. of the deal. And so all of these things circle around, if you will, that individual or family who was in uh, that poverty experience, you okay. know, and everybody can play their role. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think, you know, from my vantage point, I've sought to learn all of those different uh, aspects of it so that um, while the charitable stuff is happening, um, what is it that we can do like on a policy in or meeting with politicians or businesses to relieve that pressure so that individuals don't have to keep coming through particular organizations or governments, um, you know, accessing uh, government agencies where these individuals can just do it on their own. Right. And they're free to do it on their own and not have to jump through a lot of hoops and paperwork. And you need this, you need this form, you hey. need to go to this person. And then yep. after 30 days, then we'll give you a card to get you food. Yep. Like, yep. <laughs> you know, so. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's tough, uh, so, you know, seeing 
what people have to go through, but it's also it uh, I'm reminded there are a lot of resilient people out there. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of individuals and families who are going at it from sunup to sundown. sundown. Um, they may be beating feet to get mm-hmm. to their job, uh, yeah. bum, uh, getting a ride to get to their job, riding a bike. You know, it's raining. I mean, but they're seeking to make it happen because right. somewhere in them, they want something better. Right. Um, and I don't think a lot of that is talked about enough. Um, that's one of the things we try to talk about a lot is, um, an individual in poverty, we shouldn't pity them. Right. You know, um, but look at those things that they are doing and be like, man, I see you. Hey lady, I see you. Yep. Like that's hard, but I see you. What can I, there's things I can learn from you. Right. Like DL, there's so many things I've learned from individuals who are in these particular situations. Right. Well, shoot, I need to check my own self. Yep. You know? Yeah. I, um, I was getting ready, you know, as you were talking, you know, the thing that kept going through my mind was it seems like the approach that you're taking toward poverty is really a proper approach to take toward individuals, period. Yes. And, you know, I'm, I, I get I don't, I don't know if you see any of the Internet squabbles that I get caught up into, which I'm going to be working on extracting myself out of and not getting involved <laughs> so much. Well, I got di- I got knee deep in a one on homelessness that was talked <laughs> about. Yeah. Yeah. That one came up that I did. I, that one wasn't one that I got too terribly um, involved in. Yeah. Um, although sure. my co-host, when, when I'm doing when right now that we're doing the, um, the 20 libertarians on 25 issues, we did talk about the homelessness and he actually works with the homeless here in Jacksonville. Uh-huh. And he said a few things that, you know, I didn't realize, like he said, um, He said one of the things that people don't realize is that there is a lot of self-policing in the homeless community. He said you can go somewhere and maybe somebody who is homeless is acting up and the others will be like, no, don't. That's that's not acceptable. And and they will check him right there on the spot. And, you know, and I didn't realize I mean, I should have realized it because this happens frequently in communities in general. Yeah. Um, it just, I guess it just never really occurred to me that the structure that I'm used to in the communities that I'm involved in may also be present in like the homeless community. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, I think that people tend to look at different communities as having less structure when they really need to look at it and say it's different structure, not really less. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's why I was asking you, like, because I know that some of the some of the things that I get a lot of heat for is, you know, hey, you know, we need to not talk to like bigots and whatnot. And I'm like, depends. Right. Like there is a time and a place. And, and I always and I, and I did a bunch of research and I, and I even had a whole podcast episode on it where I basically said, the reason that, that you know, the, the way that you fight back against bigotry, because I, I think that most bigotry, what underlies it is ignorance. Yes. And so the way that you fight that is to fight the ignorance. And the first thing, like if I have some perception about who you are, the first thing I need to do is confront that perception. And the only way that I can do that is to listen and hear what you have to say without yeah. trying to take you through the ringer. Yeah. And the big key I think that people don't realize is that applies to everyone. So even if like, even if I'm coming from a place of advantage and I'm from polite circles and all this good stuff, and I'm talking to somebody who's not from polite circles, right? Maybe he's got some really bad ideas. Mm -hmm. I still need to approach them because um, in that same manner, because I have perceptions about them that I may not realize uh, yeah. At least, you know, that, that in, in, in the way that they can see those perceptions, they're not stupid, yeah. you know? So, you know, and, and I think that's no, the I, big divide we have. I mean, tell me what, I mean, is, is that, do you see that? Do you experience that when you're working with like poverty and? and yes, I do. So I, 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 I treat every person that comes to the door as an individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, there's no 
it makes absolute no sense to seek to drop a box, a preformed box Mm -hmm. on a individual who comes in, who is experiencing homelessness or poverty, because the experience of poverty looks different for each individual or each household. It just does. Um, Now you can obviously do uh, a quantitative research study, Mm -hmm. right? And, and depersonalize everybody and turn them into numbers and statistics and, and and all that kind of stuff out of a sample size. But the, the reality is when the rubber meets the road, that individual who comes through that door Mm -hmm. has a different experience of poverty than the next individual is going to come right behind him. Right. So because of that, I have to take him or her in their experience. Mm-hmm. And then when the next person comes through, I need to check, I need to put that previous meeting to the side and address and respect the next individual that's coming in right. front of me because right. they're going to have different capacities. Um, they're going to need different resources. Mm-hmm. Um, there's going to be reasons why um, the resources that work for the individual A is not going to work for individual B, right. you know? Um, and, you know, that stuff going the other direction, mm-hmm. what you're talking about, like working with people who have different political views right. or controversial views, it was working with, it was the years working with um, these beautiful men and women mm-hmm. in poverty situation that, that, they taught me how to then engage with people who have views different than me. What do I mean? So I, one day I got a letter um, from somebody. Uh, It was sent to our uh, office and it was just simply a letter handwritten. And it simply said, you know, why don't you go do your, your, your nigger, nigger work elsewhere. If you got to bleep that out. Sorry. We'll We'll, we'll push the limits to see what happens. Okay. Um, and I said, okay. And around the table was, uh, for the guys that I was doing leadership development, I was developing them as leaders. There was in college and they was all shook. Right. And just blew away. And I looked at the letter and I said, well, okay, well, I wish I knew who it was. Cause I would love to sit down with you right. know, whoever sent it. Right. Right. So I right. kept it. Um, about a year and a half later after that, a coffee shop in town, um, the owner was away for the weekend. This made the news. And her cook, who belonged to a white supremacist organization, mm-hmm. uh, held a meeting at the coffee shop. And the uh-huh. owner didn't know about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so uh, it, on appearance, it was like the owner was okay with it. And so mm-hmm. by guilt by association, right. right? So I met with the cook. Um And I was like, hey, I just want to sit down and understand you. Right. What are your views? You know, your, you know, white, white nationalist views and so on. I mean, it's all before Trump and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. And all the, you know, it's gone nuclear now. Right. Um, But that was my first time sitting with somebody and I just Mm -hmm. sat and I listened. I didn't give any judgment on his, his thoughts at the moment. Right. I just wanted to understand what this individual had to say, what it is that he or what he believed and valued. Right. Mm -hmm. And even what he understood about me. Right. You know? Um, And at the end of it, he was like, nobody has ever asked me this before. Right. And I said, probably not. Right. And and I told him, I don't agree with the things that you said. Mm hmm. I'm going to need to do some work on understanding why you right. believe is what you said, but I at least wanted you to know that I wanted to hear you out. Right. And that kind of put me on a trajectory of actually me holding meetings around the city and trying oh, wow. to bring different. Yeah. It, it became like a big thing. Like we had a Confederate flag rally one year uh, <laughs> that happened in the city. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so you're, people, you're, you're like Daryl Davis number two. I, I guess so. And wow. I want to hear. I want to learn. Right. And I think 
Um, what I've learned from, again, the individuals who I work with on a daily basis in poverty situations, they want to be heard. Right. I don't always have to agree with right. what they say or even the decisions that they make. Right. Right. But they want to be heard. Right. I bring it all the way into some of these other issues that we're facing even today. Mm-hmm. Um, like you, I listened to your uh, episode on the, the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. Okay. Uh, right. Yep. Thing. Again, people want to be heard. Right. Right. Let's let's hear what it is that they have to say, why it is they believe that they believe. Mm-hmm. And then find some, there's some, I always believe there's some common ground that can be found in most things. Right. Um, right. There's some other things that's like, oh, come on now. Like, right. it's gone too far. But I think in most things, we can find some common ground. Right. And then work out the wrinkles. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then there's some other things, I think, uh, you know, when you get into the realm of like bigotry and mm-hmm. uh you know, that kind of stuff for myself, I still want to hear it. Mm-hmm. I want to sit down with that person and hear them out. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, applying what, what I think was uh, very uh, apt with how Martin Luther King approached it back in the fifties and sixties, mm-hmm. that really helped me a lot. Right. Because then I got to go back and, um, be like, okay, or oh, here's a prime example. People like to throw away, throw around the word fascist all the time. Right. right? And, and I realized one day I was like, well, what is fascism actually? Right. You know, so I, you know, went and did like some deep dives into some stuff mm-hmm. and like trying to understand it, you know, read some of Mein Kampf. That's mm-hmm. like, wow. You know, but, <laughs> but if you're trying to understand so that you can, you can engage with somebody honestly mm-hmm. um, and engage with them uh, to, I think, hopefully persuade them towards, right. in that case, something better. Right. You got to understand where it is that they're coming from. Right. And so you got to kind of check your feelings at the door mm-hmm. um, and uh, come of it from a, a very objective standpoint. Right. Um, and then go from there. And so, you know, in my poverty, working with the men and women and at Coho, mm-hmm. you know, seek to apply that same thing. And, you know, even with uh, other stuff that I deal with today. Uh, right. I, and I think in doing so, a lot of change can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I feel like it's a, a skill that that you build and and I know I pointed out bigotry and that's just because it's the most recent thing that I've yeah. kind of applied it to but I've applied it elsewhere like I applied it when I was a youth director working with kids that were from the wrong side of the track and mm-hmm. we weren't necessarily dealing with bigotry issues I mean that yeah. I mean, there were there was some of that occasionally but it was more like poverty and trying to you know bring these young men into adulthood to a place where they could go on their own and be productive members of society. And Mm -hmm. when I say productive members of society, I just mean somebody that isn't relying on other people and has the opportunity to do, uh, to to seek out maybe a dream and see if they can't make it happen. Yes. Right. Um, You know, whether, and it doesn't have to be a big dream. It can just be like, hey, you know, I've, I grew up poor and I would really love to be, a skydive instructor. Okay, mm-hmm. great. How? What's the first thing that we need to do to make that happen? Not you can't make it. Like no, like I, I want you to be able to to pursue those dreams, no matter how big or small they might be. Yeah. And uh, you know, I built that skill a long time ago, but I built it by necessity, not by education. There wasn't anybody that was sitting by telling me. It was yeah. just a simple fact. If you want to speak, uh, I'm trying to think of how you say this, if you want to speak to the lives of people that are in a different social class than you, mm-hmm. you have one of two choices. Don't speak or figure out the ways in which they are going to hear you. Yes. And the ways that they are going to hear you um, are 
listening to them first. Yes. And and, and it was and, and and I've got so many stories that I could you know go back and talk about. Like this is an instance where people misunderstood and they thought, oh, you're coming to church, therefore you're just going to fall in line with all these things. And I was like, no, like that's not how it works. <laughs> and you know, and I was like, you need to be a part of their life. It's the old adage, right? People don't care. How's it go? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. Yeah, right. They don't care right. what you have to say until they know you're really going to be there. Are you just a, a person that's flying in, you know, because you're going to, you know, save them? Or yeah. are you really going to be there when it matters? Yeah. You know, when they yeah. make a mistake um, yeah. and that's, do something wrong. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one of the things I've been trying to share with uh, libertarians in our state is mm -hmm. it, you can make the argument um, – the Democratic Party used as a lock on being present mm -hmm. in particular areas, right? right. Uh, Republicans, not as much. Right. And trying to communicate to libertarian friends, you know, it's one thing to talk about all these theories, right? You know, all these, you know, Rothbard and Mises and um, all of these great things that you read and, you know, memes you share. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you got to, get down to flesh and blood individuals and they got to right. feel you right you know they got to feel your breath hear your voice they got to mm -hmm. see you involved in their neighborhood community things right. like that not mm -hmm. just on the election year type mm -hmm. stuff but they need to see you being present right and then when they see you being present there's the possibility, stronger possibility, mm -hmm. they're going to want to hear you on all these other things, right? The, you know, the political things. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to to do these things so that you can get political buy-in from somebody. Right. I'm simply asking you to do this for being a human being, right. showing people what it is, you know, for individual responsibility or how to use. This is what using my freedom looks like, right? In, in helping other people. Um, and then that opens the door for other conversations, mm -hmm. if you will. Right. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. People don't, they don't care. They don't, they're not going to pay attention if they don't know you don't care. Right. So, um, I think the more that we can do that now, just as human beings, period, mm -hmm. uh, the further we can go individually, but then also, you know, as our particular locales, wherever we live, right. Uh, it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the the thing that I'm trying to foster here as an affiliate chair is mm -hmm. that we get out in the community and we do things. We don't just go out and tell everybody that we're the better party. We show them that we're the better party and we yeah. we do things like park cleanups, you know, yeah. and we went out to a bad side of town and we um, it was kind of funny. It's 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 the north side. And so it's predominantly black and our group is predominantly white ish and mm -hmm. um but what we what we were trying to do is we have three city council candidates and okay. one of them is a black man and he lives out in that area. And so we are like, okay. we want to go and be seen in your district because we're going to be asking people from your district to vote for you when it comes to mm -hmm. city council. And so we're given kind of a little priority to where our candidates are located. Yeah. And, but we're also trying to hit as many parks all over the place because we want to get visible. And we in, you know, what I said was. We need to lead the way and we need to show them what this libertarian utopia might even mm -hmm. just look like, even just look if like. it's a glimpse, yeah. right? And if we say that we don't need the state to clean up the parks, then by golly, we have to be the ones to you show to them, clean up. <laughs> right? So we went out to this, uh, we went out to this, uh, this area and, um, People that are in Jacksonville would know it. It's uh, it's, it's off Moncrief Road. It's you know very notable. I think even when Cat Williams came down and did a show here, he made uh -huh. a lot of jokes about it. You know, okay. so so this is you know it, this is considered like the you know the bad part of town. Okay. Well, first and foremost, they had so many tennis courts. I was totally amazed. I was like, I didn't know that there was going to be this many tennis courts uh, uh -huh. on this side of town because you just don't really associate tennis, right? You know, with. Uh, 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 areas were, of town I, that aren't yeah. as you think of like the rich people, right? The rich yeah, parts of yeah. town are where all the tennis courts, but they had a lot. And there were a lot of people out there on this Saturday morning playing tennis. And okay. we started, we started walking by 
and we're picking up trash and we've got our yellow shirts on that just say Libertarian yeah. Duval Party of uh, 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 Libertarian Party of Duval County. And I've got my son. Another woman has her son. And there's like probably like 10 of us. Okay. And these guys like stop playing tennis. And they're like, hey, we love what you're doing. Like, mm-hmm. like it was immediate. Like they knew some group was here to clean up the park because mm-hmm. we were, you know, there yeah. we were with bags and picking up stuff. And then they saw that we brought our kids. And they were like, you know, they were like, this is awesome. You know, you train them up the right way. Yeah. And it, it didn't it, – we, we didn't go out there like, okay, we're going to go out there, f- you know, for the poor black people. We went out right. there like, this is a park in our city yes. that we want to make sure it's clean. Yes. And when we got there, the people that regularly go to that park were there, and they mm-hmm. saw it, and they appreciated it. And, and to me, that's how you libertarian, right? You, you yes. get out, and you don't do it for a demographic – I mean, right. you, you may tailor things a little bit. I mean, you yeah. still got to be a little wise in that sense. Yeah. But you ultimately are just you, – you're like, okay, everybody's a human being. How do I treat them like a human being? And different human beings have different needs. Right. Um, and, and so that's that's what we – you know, that's what I try to instill, and, and that's what I try to push in the party. And, you know, when it comes to some topics, it's not always well-received, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. th- this, you know, it's a new thing and, you know, there's skepticism and all this other stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. but it's the same. And if, if you, um, or, you know, I'm sure that if I started a, a, a homeless project or a poverty project, there'd be a lot of similar skepticism and a lot of similar, like, no, you can't do it that way. You've got to do right. it this way. This way. Like, yeah. No, you've got to start by meeting people where they are. Yes. And if you want to influence somebody, you have to meet them where they are. So that they will want to hear where you are. Yeah. Right. So that, that's just that's that's, it. that's that's what I've got. Um, we're running up at our hour. I know I want to be mindful yeah. of your time. So where can we? Fi- it was a great conversation. You had some oh, amazing yeah. things to say. Yeah. I, I'm I'm I've been trying not to stare at your background. <laughs> Because oh. <laughs> you got just a, an amazing background. I, you can't see it, but my background is literally a green wall. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, I painted my wall green and my other wall has a green screen cloth over it and there's nothing okay, really yeah. exciting. And I'm so envious of it because you got that, like that huge shield. And then you, yeah. I, I think between the shield and Dr. Soul, I think I'm, I'm super yeah. envious of both of those. Yeah. So, yeah. My, yeah. My kids got that shield for me for, uh, Father's Day. Oh, nice. Years ago. Yeah. So, so that is, that, that's just, that's super amazing. But where can we find you? You mentioned you had a podcast and then you also have yeah. a YouTube channel and then any, um, any organizations where people can find you. Yeah. So you can just go to my website, philipfletcher.org. That's Philip with two L's. Mm-hmm. Um, and we send out a weekly, uh, newsletter, uh, just encouragement to people, um, offers some thought provoking questions to really uh, lead people to do some self-reflection, but also how to engage one another in a more humane manner. Mm -hmm. Um, You can find me on YouTube, Philip Fletcher, PhD. Uh, My podcast is called Humanity Matters Podcast. And uh, we have episodes that release on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Okay. Um, And we have a YouTube show that goes out Sunday nights at eight o'clock okay uh, central standard time um my nonprofit is coho 58.org and you can learn everything that we do about the city of hope outreach there um you can find me on facebook as well just put in dr philip fletcher okay uh, love to connect with people love to have discussions with people um i i have an open table uh good, good. i want to learn from everybody uh, like I tell people, I want to, I'm a learn. I may not agree, right. but I want to learn, but I awesome. want you to learn from me as well. And, yeah. uh, at the end of the day, um, I like to discuss, it's a quote I saw. I would rather discuss ideas and not people. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're going to talk about people, let's have fun together and right. enjoy one another's company and encourage one another. Uh, we can arm wrestle over ideas. That's cool. right. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the time, DL. It's been a great conversation. And uh, my encouragement to you is just uh, continue to be a, a a a model for what it is to be a father and talking mm-hmm. about that openly and uh, your work you're doing in, in Jacksonville. And, you know, 
continue to carry the torch for liberty. And doing my best. Yeah, yeah. And, and just never, yeah, I just never forget uh, uh, we're all human beings made in God's image and likeness. And I just yep. believe uh, regardless of our political, social, religious mm -hmm. differences and all that, uh, it's it doesn't take much to be loved, be kind, and be generous and courageous with people. So. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. I'll put all those links in the show notes for people to, cool. to check cool. out. Yeah. So, uh, but with that, I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the show. Uh, Dr. Philip Fletcher, make sure you check him out in the show notes. Thanks, D.L. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me an email to libertydadpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Prefer an audio format? Then head on over to libertydad.com or just search for Liberty Dad, all one word, on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.